Good afternoon, and welcome to the Harvard Chan Studio. Uh, my name is Steve Benjamin. I'm the former mayor of Columbia, South Carolina, and former president of the United States Conference of Mayors. I'm so pleased to be a part of this conversation with my friend, Lori Lightfoot, the former mayor of Chicago, recently finished her term. And I want to welcome all of our online uh, audience uh, and to the students, staff, and, and faculty uh, sitting here uh, in the studio here with us. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover, so we're going to get straight to it. Um, Mayor, it's good to see you, my friend. <laughs> good to see you, as always. It's always great to see you. Um, your personal story is so interesting. Uh, you spent years as a federal prosecutor, mm -hmm. as an attorney for the city of Chicago, as president of the Chicago Police Board, be before you decided to run for mayor. And this is obviously one of the most significant and consequential cities of the world. Um, and the first office you sought was mayor <laughs> uh, of, of the city. Um, what motivated you to run? Well, it's interesting you um, talk about my background, but really my background is what motivated me and not the professional life um, so much that I led, but really um, where I grew up. Um, I'm the child of two people who grew up in a segregated South in the 1920s. And my whole life, I listened to stories from my father and from my mother talking about the daily indignities that they endured uh, because of the crushing yoke of Jim Crow. And fast forward, I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to go to University of Chicago Law School, which is what took me to Chicago. Um, but what I saw all around me, this, this city that I only knew from Ebony and Jet magazines, mm -hmm. um, where all the fancy people were going to parties, and that was part of it. But what I saw and came to know over my time is that it was definitely a tale of at least two cities, if not three or four, and that for many people, growing up in circumstances like mine, they had no shot at turning their life around because the city government, in particular, didn't see them. Businesses didn't invest in their neighborhoods. Um, the city government didn't invest in their neighborhoods. And the cycle of poverty, which is really at the root cause of almost every social ill that I can think of, that continued to perpetuate generation after generation. And at a time, uh, 15, 16, um, where violence was spiking in the city, I, I looked for answers because I felt like surely a world-class city like Chicago with the incredible intellectual and business um, uh, savvy and talent um, that existed, we could address some of these issues. But what I quickly learned is it really takes leadership. Mm -hmm. And it takes leadership. The city is conditioned um, to look to a strong mayor to make a difference. I didn't see that difference on the landscape. And over several years, if you had asked me not that long ago, will you ever run for office, I would have told you you were crazy. <laughs> and I definitely would have told you you were, you were insane to think that I would run for mayor. But I just felt like I had benefited so much from the city um, mm -hmm. that I had something to offer. And, you know, I'm not a person who lives my life with regrets, and I really started feeling like if I didn't take this plunge, knowing how steep the hill was going to be to climb against an incumbent who had a lot of money, could raise a lot of money, um, but if I didn't do that and articulate a set of issues and values around equity, that I'd regret it for the rest of my life. So yeah. that's what uh, led me to jump off uh, the high dive into the deep end, um, and, and my wife eventually said, yes, I wore it down. <laughs> Uh, and you and you shook up the political world. I mean, you you took office, and some of you, uh, the mayor referenced uh, Ebony and Jet magazines. If you're not familiar uh, with uh, those publications, significant in the history of black media, I'd encourage you to, to um, uh, Google them and, <laughs> and and learn about the role um, certainly uh, that they played, even um, shaping the civil rights era. Yep. Um, think of maybe Till Mobley and um, Emmett Till's. Um, uh, uh, body being displayed and how it helped mm -hmm. fuel the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. How do you juxtapose that with the current world in which we live, in which social media mm -hmm. uh, dominates everything? I think you described it as a cacophony uh, just, of just noise, and I can only imagine. Um, how, how did you learn to adjust your leadership style to to deal with the world and, and, um, and this environment that we well, know. It, it was a little bit of if you can't beat them, join them. Mm -hmm. um, look, I, I'm not a huge fan of social media, and I think social media companies still get a pass on what is propagated, particularly hate, um, but also criminal activity that's propagated on way too many social media platforms. And, mm -hmm. you know, 
hopefully at some point in the, the near future, we're going to do something to um, hold those folks accountable and make them be good corporate actors. Um, but meanwhile, it exists. Um, and it's a way in which increasingly a significant number of residents um, get their news, get information um, from uh, the variety of social media platforms. So ignoring it entirely is really not an answer, but I think being strategic about how it's used. So I had some very smart 20-year-olds um, who uh, took over our digital media strategy. Um, one of the best, I think, marketing people uh, in the country who came on as our chief marketing officer. And particularly during COVID, we really tried to turn um, social media into a way for us to alleviate people's fears and concerns, but communicate directly uh, with the, the public. So, you know, memes took off uh, of me and um, other things during COVID, which was helpful. But social media is, is, is really tough because there's a lot of tremendous disinformation um, on social media that people take as the gospel. Um, there's a lot of conspiracy theories that um, have a very active life on social media. Um, but it's tough as an elected official in this time when the media landscape not only is start increasingly dominated by social media, but pr traditional media, I think, has not kind of found its level yet. We see consolidation of, of media platforms, a lot of media sources disappearing, hedge funds buying up this, that, or the other. Um, you know, this is probably the only time you'll hear me say something nice about the media. Um, it's a tough time to be a reporter um, in a traditional media platform. Um, but I, I do think that the media, whether it's social media or traditional media, also has to step up and be a part of truth telling and not just a race to the bottom to get clicks on a website. Yeah. That's all you had nice to say about, <laughs> about traditional media? <laughs> oh, no. I can um, say a lot more. <laughs> Uh, you, of course, reference the um, the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, and obviously, um, really reaches high um, by the year into your yeah. um, your your leadership at the city of Chicago. Um, in, in that, you, you mentioned it already a, a few times, and, and certainly, I think every public uh, discourse we've ever had um, leadership at the Conference of Mayors and African American Mayors Association. You, the word equity just yeah. always pops in. I mean, yeah. It's central to who you are. You said um, that you use COVID uh, as an opportunity to try and right some historic wrongs. Uh, mm -hmm. What would you mean by that? Well, you know, look, it, we in the early m months, I'll say, of COVID, um, we were we. I think it felt like the country was in this together mm -hmm. before the divisions really became uh, more prominent. And as an elected official. I knew it was my responsibility to make sure that I was speaking regularly to the public, uh, being as transparent as possible, um, really emphasizing data and the science, which I firmly believe in. Um, but also, it gave us an opportunity, I think, to right historic wrongs. So for example, in April of uh, 2020, when we started getting the early data back on who was getting sick with COVID, who was dying of COVID, we learned at that point that African Americans in my city were dying at seven times the rate of any other demographic. I mean, that's a devastating, devastating fact. Um, and I remember my initial reaction was thinking about my own family thinking about my, my mother who, God bless her, just turned 95 yesterday, um, thinking about uh, my older siblings who um, have underlying conditions, and knowing that my own family story was repeated thousands and tens of thousands of times across my city. So we had to come up with real concrete solutions, and we put together a task force. We focused on the neighborhood where we were seeing the highest rate of deaths. We went into that neighborhood with some preconceived notions about what we could do to help the local population. And they said, no, 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 hold up. What we need right now is we need food. We need um, you to help us with the, the food insecurity that um, our people are suffering. So the long-standing problems of food insecurity, of homelessness, of substance addiction, of mental health, of lack of affordable housing, mm -hmm. all those things were flashing like neon signs during COVID. And in order for us to kind of win the hearts and minds of community that we needed to help the most, mm -hmm. we had to meet them where they were. Mm -hmm. And they were telling us, this, these are our priorities. Yeah, we know about COVID. 
and we know that we need to do something about it, but these are the immediate um, priorities that we need. That gave us the opportunity to bond with these communities and bring the resources of the, and the power of city government to help address some of these issues. And my mantra throughout COVID to my team was no temporary scaffolding. I didn't want to just put a Band-Aid over gaping wounds. If we were going to go in, if we were going to form these relationships that we were going to subsequently need, and we did, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to make sure that we were bringing real foundational change that was going to improve the quality of life of residents for re mm -hmm. forever, not just sure. for the moment. Sure, well, that's fantastic. I count that as a great success. You, you, um, you follow the data? and you humanize yep. it and, and solve problems. I remember coming out of the uh, pandemic, I came literally within three weeks, I was straight here on this campus uh -huh. coming to learn from you all and some of your uh, predecessors. Um, what are some of your biggest regrets uh, post-COVID? Uh, um, it's a challenging time to lead. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, as I, I said, I'm not a person who spends a lot of time um, thinking about the regret, um, but I think that we, um, there's so much more work to do. Mm -hmm. um, I worry about the constant divisiveness of um, our civic discourse mm -hmm. where we don't know each other. Um, we demonize people who we believe have different views um, than we do. I was traveling recently um, and an older white gentleman um, came to me and recognized who I was. He's like, I don't think I believe in anything that you believe politically, but I think you got a really, really, really raw deal, which was kind of a nice thing to say. I said, but I said, you know, I bet you pro we probably have more in common than you think. Mm -hmm. Taking mm -hmm. that time to have that kind of discourse mm -hmm. is so hard to do. Mm -hmm. And you really, you got to do it person by person. You know, I, I mentioned that when we had this challenge, with African Americans dying at such a high rate, we put together a task force and initially it was just focused on the African American community, which is what the data told us we needed to do. But then when we continue to see really high case rates in the Latinx communities across our city, we added those um, stakeholders to this team. Um, and as a result of that, one great thing that came out of it is people who live in the same city who were doing similar kind of work one in black communities, one in Latinx communities, never knew each other before. Now they're working together to build capacity amongst small indigenous um, community-based organizations in respective communities and do it in a way that they're coming together and recognizing their brothers and sisters from different neighborhoods. Um, that's a tremendous thing um, coming out um, of COVID. So I wish we could have done more of that. Mm -hmm. um, we're, it's not too late ever um, to build those bridges, um, but there's so much um, additional work that needs to be done at, at the local level. And you and I are biased. Mm -hmm. um, we know that mayors get stuff done. Um, but what I've also said to, to people as I was kind of doing a series of fail, farewell speeches, you don't need a golden ticket from the mayor to do good. This is seize that opportunity. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be the leader. You may not feel comfortable leading a particular cause, but roll your sleeves up and do something. Mm -hmm. And hold elected officials accountable. Mm -hmm. But don't wait for a mayor to decree this is now our priorities. You live in your neighborhoods on your block. You know exactly what your priorities and what your needs are. Like the people who told us, hey, this COVID thing, fine, but we need food. They knew what their needs were. Mm -hmm. And we've got to do more, I think, in this country to really empower people at the block level um, because that's what should be really driving change. Mm -hmm. No, fantastic. Uh, I remember um, I think a lot of us were very excited uh, before uh, COVID. You outlined some, some really bold plans to spur economic growth mm -hmm. uh, in, in Chicago, especially for communities of color. Mm -hmm. um, um, Curious what advances you feel uh, you made in that space uh, and what are some lessons or some lessons you hope other mayors or, or, or other uh, others who might seek mm -hmm. to lead in their own way uh, might learn from your approach? Well, I, I'm particularly proud of the work that we did around economic empowerment and wealth, man, uh, wealth um, generation. Uh, a couple things that I would highlight. Um, in the fall of 2019, way before anybody knew anything about COVID, we um, 
uh, declared that our major economic initiative was going to be something called Invest Southwest. Now, if you know Chicago, it's the South Side and the West Side, majority black and, and uh, Latinx. Um, at that time, we had uh, what I felt like was a pretty bold plan of uh, investing 750 million city dollars into um, 10 uh, neighborhoods, 12 different commercial corridors, to kind of bring them back to their former glory so that these uh, front doors, if you will, of neighborhoods, um, the vital commercial um, centers would, would be regenerated and generate customers, generate um, more attractive streetscapes for businesses to come, and through that really generate other investment. My hope was we top off um, and get to a billion dollars with um, private sector funding. Well, then COVID hit. Um, and, um, but I will tell you, when we celebrated the three-year anniversary of our Invest Southwest program, remember I said 750 million? We um, were at 2.2 billion by then. Wow. Almost evenly divided between um, uh, private sector and government uh, funding. So I'm enormously proud of that. There are cranes up in the air on the south side and west side of Chicago, and I will tell you, I'm getting chills just talking about it. That hasn't happened in a generation. Mm. And we not only um, invested these dollars in vertical construction, in streetscapes, but we empowered a generation of black and Latino um, uh, developers and construction companies who were doing good work, but never got the opportunity um, to get uh, assignments of you know, 14, 15, uh, 30 million, 40 million dollars. Sure. And that's what we were able to do. And we required them, every neighborhood that we went into, that the development teams had to look like the people in the neighborhood. They had to generate jobs, not just in the construction, but permanent jobs mm -hmm. that were going to remain in that neighborhood. About um, So that's one of the things I'm very proud of. But another thing I have to tell you I'm really proud of is um, this. We called it the fines and fees reform. We came into office with a knowing that the city was owed literally hundreds of millions of dollars of old debt going back to the 90s. Wow. That clearly was never going to be collected. But what that meant is the people who owed it from city practices in prior administrations, they were um, stripped of the opportunity to ever get a city job because they had city debt. In many instances, they were getting tagged for non-moving violations that left them uh, without a driver's license because we were in cahoots with uh, state government. Um, they, so they would lose their cars, lose their driving privileges. Um, and Chicago became the number one Chapter 13 filing jurisdiction in the country. That means people filing for individual bankruptcy as a result of city debt. So one of the first things that we did was start to relieve our residents of that debt. We gave them the opportunity to clear away all that old debt. We went to folks and said, look, you owe us money. Let's figure out a plan. You pay us amount that you set on a monthly basis <clears throat> for one year, 12 months. And if you pay every month based upon what you decide, all your old debt is going to be washed away. And then we took that same model. Um, the city, b b before I became mayor, if you fell behind in your water and sewer bills, guess what? They'd cut you off. Imagine living someplace where you don't have access to water. I, I got, I, we had our kitchen redone and didn't have water for a week, and I thought I was going to lose my mind. Imagine <laughs> living in a house where you don't have water. Water is a basic human right. So we did the same thing with water. Pay us an amount you set for 12 months, and all your old debt is literally washed away. And then we took that to the next step. Building owners, um, commercial, um, but also residential, were getting tagged with city fines. We did the same thing in that forum. I can't tell you the number of people um, that would come up to me in random settings, li literally like the grocery store, and say, Mayor, I have to thank you. I'm one of those people who owe debt. And, and because of what you did, I got my driver's license back. Mm -hmm. I was able to get a car, get insurance, and now I have a job. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, there's nothing re more rewarding. You know this mm -hmm. from your own experience. When mm -hmm. you, you take an idea, you work with 
the relevant stakeholders and the policy experts. You put it into action, but then you see how it's affecting people's lives in a positive way. Mm -hmm. that's, that's meaningful. That's meaningful. Miss that proximity to, yeah. to that real um, genuine <clears throat> citizen feedback. Um, so you, you were the head of the Chicago Police Board and, <laughs> and, and chair of, of police account, the Police Accountability Task Force yeah. and still decided to run for mayor. That's a whole other story. <laughs> um, how did that relationship um, uh, with uh, law enforcement officers, um, I, did it change um, uh, that relationship or your perception of, of police um, once you became mayor? And, and what would you say might be the um, top uh, one or two reforms uh, mm -hmm. that you that probably people might be able to learn from you or yeah. might need to be enacted nationwide? So, you know, I've been around the Chicago Police Department for a long time. Um, you know, as you mentioned, I'm a former federal prosecutor and prosecuted corrupt police officers. Um, I took a job inside of uh, the police department um, running a civilian organization called the Office of Professional Standards that had been around since the 70s, and we investigated allegations of police misconduct. But we also investigated police-involved shootings, so I probably investigated more police-involved shootings than any civilian in the country. So I've had a lot of experience of dealing with the police, um, dealing with police unions, um, and really kind of seeing police departments from inside out. <clears throat> I would say the relationship with individual police officers was solid, with the union, terrible. Um, we have a, uh, a Chicago, the largest police union is run by somebody who is a um, January 6th apologist, um, who has said every unkind, racist, xenophobic, homophobic, the list is long sure. uh, thing imaginable. It's frankly disgraceful that that guy's leading the union, but there are a lot of people who believe him and who follow him. And he, as a, my political people used to tell me all the time, there are some people that you encounter when you're an elected official whose only relevance is in opposition to you. Sure. <clears throat> so we had to deal with him, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't deal with him directly. Um, but unfortunately, he did a lot of things that I think hurt his members. Things that I, we did that I'm proud of is we gave them a great contract. Um, one of my imperatives was I wasn't going to let contracts expire and then have three or four years go by before you even start the negotiations. When I came into office, the police contract had been expired for a couple years. We quickly got to work, even through a transition in um, leadership, um, and got that done so that our brave men and women who are risking their lives every day for our safety got compensated fairly. Um, it was a good deal for them, but importantly also a good deal uh, for the taxpayers. But we also um, impose accountability members as, uh, measures as, as part of that. Chicago, second largest police department in the country, um, people worked side jobs. We had no idea what those side jobs were. We had no idea how long um, they were working their side jobs. I put an end to that and made sure that from that contract forward, um, there was going to be a level of accountability. I made sure, the lawyer and me, um, that we were just hemorrhaging money in settlements and judgments and attorney's fees. Before I came into office, um, the previous 10 years, we had spent over a billion dollars in settlements, judgments, and attorney's fees. So we worked to try to reform what was clearly a very broken system. Important reforms, and again, as a former mayor, you'll appreciate this, um, I would get emails 24-7 from things that were happening in the city from the police department's perspective. And early on in my tenure, I kept seeing these um, emails around police pursuits. And I thought, well, what is our policy around police pursuits? And then I had somebody dig into, well, are, is, do we have any uh, liability issues there? Well, of course, we did. A billion dollars that had been spent um, on uh, settling cases related to pursuits because we had no policy. Mm -hmm. You Somebody ran a light. You could run um, at 100 miles an hour, lights and sirens through the city chasing somebody who ran a red light mm -hmm. and, and, and ended up doing property damage and damage to individuals and, and a number of deaths. So we reformed that policy. We reformed our, our um, <clears throat> search uh, warrant policy, reformed our foot pursuit policy, and probably one of the most dangerous things that police um, engage in. And importantly, for the first time, 
we put $20 million uh, into officer wellness programs to deal with the trauma and the stress that they were facing on a daily basis. So I'm proud of the things that we did, both in terms of supporting the police, but also holding them way more accountable um, than they had been before. I hadn't planned to ask you this, but I remember <laughs> a statistic, um, not, not one gun store in the city of Chicago. No, uh, all the guns, we, 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 our officers take more guns off the street than New York or LA combined every year. Mm -hmm. It goes up and up and up. I think last year's was over 12,000. We don't have a single gun shop, stop, uh, shop in the city of mm -hmm. Chicago. Our, our suburbs have them. Indiana has them. Um, and literally, if you got the uh, handful of cash, you can drive over the border to, to Gary or Hammond and literally buy military-grade weapons and bring them back to the city of Chicago. And that's our gun problem mm -hmm. right there. Yeah, I remember that. <clears throat> I thought it was worth highlighting. Um, you were the first openly gay mayor yes. of, of Chicago. Um, I'd love for you to pull back from your focus, your, uh, your leadership on, on the city of Chicago, in particular talk a little bit about how um, LGBTQ uh, communities are under attack all mm. around uh, the country right now. Yeah. And from your perspective, what, what mayors might be able to do to respond to it? Well, it's an important question, um, and you're right. We, our community is under attack, and particularly our trans brothers and sisters. Um, but really, so many of the values that we hold dear mm -hmm. as Americans are under attack. Um, when the Supreme Court um, overturned Roe v. Wade and the Dobbs decision, um, if you want to be scared and, but also educated, I would read Justice Thomas's concurrence um, because he laid out a plan uh, for really rolling back the rights that we all take for granted. Um, uh, gay marriage, um, interracial marriage, um, contraception. Um, if you are a woman, a person of color, a member of our community, LGBTQ+, you have to know that this is a moment, an, inflection, an important inflection moment uh, for us in the history, certainly over the last 50 years. Um, and what I've urged because I straddle so many communities, we all got to come together. We can't think that this is somebody else's problem. Um, as the saying goes, um, if you're um, not at the table, you're on the menu. And too many of us um, are sitting back and waiting for somebody else uh, to carry the, uh, the stanchion forward when it really has to be us. We all have to be uh, the flag bearers. Um, but I think what we have to continue to do is to communicate and break down the barriers and look for opportunities um, to be in communion with each other. Particularly challenging, but also absolutely essential in a city like Chicago that unfortunately remains one of the most segregated cities in the country. And what I hope is by my presence as a mayor of the third largest city in the country, um, that I set an example, um, particularly for those parents that are out there whose kids are struggling um, with their own identity and want to live an authentic life. I had so many parents come to me in my four years as mayor and say, you know, my daughter, my son, um, and with concern in their eyes. And I said, you know what? If you love them, if you support them, they're going to be just fine. Mm -hmm. It's a scary thing, even in this day and age, when, frankly, the number of gay and lesbian and trans folks um, that are prominent in our society are out there. But when you see what is happening in certain states and certain state legislatures where they're demonizing people for who they are, it pushes people back, backwards. Mm -hmm. And we've got to make sure that we are continuing to wrap our arms around, particularly our young people, and love them and tell them that they're going to always be supported, that the most important thing, and I know this from my own coming out <clears throat> process, the most important thing is you've got to be true to yourself. You have to live your authentic life. I could cite countless examples of people that I know that are my age or even younger um, who are afraid to be who they are, who live lives that are not truthful to what their feelings are. And not only do you hurt yourself, you hurt the other people that are close to you who believe the facade. Um, that's that, at that personal level, I think that's important. But at the, at the macro level, particularly from a policy perspective, we cannot let hate prevail. Mm. Because it may be now 
against the trans community. It may be the larger LGBTQ plus community, but it's going to be roll around and be black. It's going to be Asian. It's going to be Jewish. Um, we are all at risk if we let any part of our society be demonized and ostracized and denied the full privileges of citizenship um, or rights as residents in our city, in our country. No, 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 thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I know we're, we're, gonna, we're having a great conversation. We could probably go on for hours, <laughs> um, uh, but we're gonna have to wrap up uh, shortly, allow some time for in-studio audience to, to ask uh, some questions um, as well. So I'm gonna give you a few uh, lightning round questions okay. uh, of sort. Uh, in, a, in a sentence, um, what was your favorite thing about being mayor? Helping people and seeing on the, in the eyes of children that they recognize that I was their mayor. Mm -hmm. And what was your least favorite? <laughs> uh, how much time do you got? <laughs> um, I don't miss the vitriol. Yeah. I don't miss the acrimony that gets played out. We talked about social media before, talked about the media before. I don't miss that at all. Um, they still keep knocking on my door. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm gone. Shed mm -hmm. that skin. Leave mm -hmm. me alone. Mm -hmm. um, what are you most glad to have off of your plate? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say it this way. What I'm most glad about in this time is being more present for my wife and my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, they sacrifice a lot. When you're an elected official, as you know, your family is in it with you. Mm -hmm. And they didn't run for office. Mm -hmm. And many times they didn't want you to run for, mm -hmm. for office. So yes. being more present at an important time in my daughter's life, being more present and taking weight off of uh, my spouse um, is, has been really important. We had a great summer together. Um, we're having a great fall. Um, and so I, I cherish that time and hopefully I'm buying more years of my life by leaving the day-to-day -day stress um, to be somebody else's concern and problem. Yes, no, um, we want many of you to consider serving somewhere, <laughs> somehow, someday, but the afterlife is pretty good. <laughs> it, 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 can be, it can be really good. Um, I wanna thank um, uh, my friend, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, um, and thank you to this uh, wonderful um, audience. Um, I want to let folks know if they've missed any part of this program, uh, they can watch it on, on the Harvard uh, Chan School's YouTube channel. Um, good afternoon, and thank you so much for, for being with us. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thanks.